All right, everybody, where it's a, a minute after, we're going to be mindful of everybody's time and get started. Now, the first thing you're probably wondering is who is this person? Why is he running this Echo? Usually Mitra and Elizabeth are running this show. Well, uh, Elizabeth is out on vacation, but Mitra actually just had a baby on Friday night. So she is out until the end of uh, December, uh, to the end of November, early December. Um, and so You'll be seeing me, unfortunately, a little bit more. I used to run the session, so this is kind of uh, old school. Um, so looking forward to it. Um, but that is what's going on. So if you do try to email Mitra, you will not get a response, but you could always, always uh, email Elizabeth or myself. Um, good to see everybody. We've got uh, a presentation today from Katie, um, who I'll turn it over to you here in a second. The second part of the session, we don't have a case, so we'll open it up for questions like we always do, whether it's related to the uh, didactic presentation or otherwise. Um, but then we are going to take five minutes, and I am actually going to show you the new iEcho system for which we will be joining the sessions in January, starting in January. Um, and I know this can be a little daunting. Uh, it's a change, uh, and this is one of the oldest projects we have. And so... We know uh, it could take a little bit to get people to get used to it. So we just want to prime you by showing it, show you what it can do, what it'll look like, um, and then kind of get your feedback as far as what's the best way to get the information to you uh, as far as making your account, getting things set up. So with all that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Katie. Uh, if you haven't put your name and information into the chat, please go ahead and do so, especially those who are in uh, conference room settings. Please be sure to uh, put everybody's name in. All right, go ahead, Katie, take it away. Thanks, Jay. It's nice to share this space with you for a little bit. Let me get my slideshow started. And then do this thing. Can you guys see my proper slides? Great, thank you for that, uh, Jay. Uh, just FYI, I'm not always the best at seeing the chat box, so please feel free to unmute yourself along the way and interrupt. Um, with any kind of questions or feedback, but then also, Jay, I'll ask you if folks are putting things in the chat that are really good to sort of put a pause and talk about that then, please let me know. Great. Um, so thanks for uh, joining me this afternoon, folks. I try to present on ethics and ethical dilemmas a couple of times a year. The presentation will always repeat some of the core concepts that I talk about each time, and that's for our newer ECHO community members who have recently joined. Um, but then also each time I do this, I always reach out to the community a month or so back to find some ethical dilemmas you've faced excuse me, recently. And so that'll be the updated part of the presentation. And for those of you that did um, give some feedback and some dilemmas, I really appreciate the discussion. So uh, just FYI, those of you that have sat in presentations with me before, the farm animals are always required to show up. That's how they earn their keep. So the field of ethics involves uh, developing, defending, and then recommending concepts of right and wrong behavior. Here's a perfect example of right behavior. So ethics looks at uh, the nature of individual good and the nature of social good and the relationship between those two. Uh, looks at the ethical motives that exist for the individual to pursue that social good or to do whatever they feel is morally right. Looks at that relationship between uh, pleasure and good. And then in modern ethics, this is about really recognizing what our duty and our moral obligation is. So thankfully, the ethical codes have changed over time in response to how our society changes, which then affects how our laws change, how our training changes, and then how we change. COVID is a great example. There's things that we had to talk about in our practice that we would never have had to talk about prior to that. So again, when things change, thankfully, we can adapt with them. So each of us in this Zoom room, we have our own separate professional ethics codes that we're required to follow. It's on each of us to understand what our personal what, you know, what those um, principles are, the ethics codes that we follow, to know what the code is to begin with, and to understand then how our personal values either fall in line with the code we're assigned to or maybe brush up against them. And so sometimes what happens is your values may not align with your profession's ethics. And so then the question is, what do you do there? Who or what do you lean on when you need help making that ethical decision? And then at the end of this presentation, we'll ha I'll have an example of sort of an ethical um, decision-making model that you can use. 
There's several different ethical codes I could talk about this afternoon. I'm going to end up referencing uh, the NADAC and the ACA Code of Ethics the most because those are the two that I follow. NADAC is the Association for Addiction Professionals, and then ACA is the American Counseling Association. So I appreciate NADAC's, NADAC's definition here. It says, ethics are generally regarded as the standards that govern the conduct of a person. And so Smith and Hodges define ethics as a human reflecting self-consciously on the act of being a moral being. And so this implies a process of how self-reflection and awareness of that, that process of how to behave as a moral being. So some definitions are dictated by law, individual belief systems, religion, or a mix of all three of those. Now, one of the aspects I find um, challenging this definition is that word moral, because so many things, including all these that they talked about, including laws, including our individual belief systems, that can really alter our perception of what we believe is moral. An example of this is the discussion about abortion. And so in reaching out to you good folks over this last month um, for suggestions on recent ethical dilemmas you faced, here are the dilemmas that were faced with me and or requested to talk about for kind of a group um, discussion. So I heard um, an issue related to patients' right to privacy. So when is it okay to gather collateral information and what does that collateral information look like? Um, what are our boundaries with patients' family members, particularly when those patient members are um, requesting us in a way that we didn't, or contacting us in a way that we didn't request or the patient didn't request? And then decisional factors of the multidisciplinary treatment team. How do we decide when to quote unquote bend the rules? So we'll start with patients' right to privacy. Uh, when we're first meeting with patients and we're gathering information on their lives, their medical care, et cetera, we want to do it in a way that's respecting their personal boundaries. That's why we want to let them know that at any point, you know, they have any right to uh, not answer questions that we're asking them. Additionally, a, a way to respect their boundaries is to let them know the ways that we're going to gather collateral information. So, for example, if I'm seeing a patient for an intake who has been a patient here at WVU Medicine, I'm going to let them know that I might be doing a chart review to try to gather the most up-to-date medical information. And then if that patient wants me to communicate with other uh, people or agencies in their lives, like a family member, probation officer, et cetera, I'm going to let them know ahead of time what I'm going to be asking from those people, what I'm going to be sharing, and then specifically not sharing with them. Now, those aren't the only ways that we could, quote unquote, gather collateral information. There, for better or worse, there's this ever-expanding internet, which can potentially give us a lot more information on someone. But just because we have all that potential personal information at our fingertips, that does not mean that we should be seeking it out. Um, I'm going to throw a, a textbook under the book here. So I teach uh, Intro to Addiction Studies for the university. Uh, and for the most part, I really love the textbook that um, you know the whole course is assigned to use. However, in the section about intakes, the author actually encourages the reader to seek out additional information about the patient online to confirm what the patient is sharing with them in an intake. Problem with that is that is a total violation of privacy. It should be our patient's right to get to share or not share parts of their story with us. And so the only ethical reason, particularly for the, you know, the therapists and um, peer recovery support specialists on here, the only ethical reason I hear of utilizing the internet to gather information is really if our patient is missing. So sometimes what happens is we're searching for patients in, in uh, the jail system because they've missed appointments and we're worried about them. They haven't gotten their medication. Or sadly, sometimes we're searching for them in the obituaries. However, it's not our role to specifically search for them online as a way to follow up and making sure that they're following their treatment process, if that makes sense. So here's two case examples. We'll look at them one at a time. The first one is that a patient reports in group that they have 60 days sobriety, but their arrest record for a DUI popped up over the weekend. It was listed on the local news station website that you happen to view every morning. So the question is, what would you do? And please feel free to unmute yourself. Please feel free to put something in the chat box. I'm gonna open that now while I'm looking at that. So what would you do with that information? Uh, 
I would probably, probably approach probably. the individual. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Marianne. Oh, no, I was just going to say, uh, I would be, I, I would probably would not say anything. Um, and part of my thinking behind that too, is that, um, I'm a person in recovery. So I see people at meetings and may get information, um, hear different information at meetings and none of that can cross over to, um, my care for them as, as patients. So if they happen to admit at a meeting that they relapsed and then come to clinic the next day and say they've got 30 days of sobriety, um, that's what I go with. You know, I, I can't, that, that's how I feel about that anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Long, thank you for that great example of when you're hearing information and in an, you know, there's an agreement with AA meetings, any meetings, et cetera, right? What's said in the meeting stays in the meeting. And so for you in that dual relationship role, it's very clear to you, you're going to keep that information confidential because that took place in a confidential space. Rich, what were you going to suggest? I was depend on where the information was disclosed, but if I was ever going to approach it to be on an individual basis, not on a group basis. Yeah, also great suggestion, right? So if you've got some concerns for the patient, to, to be fair, the information came out on a public site. You know, we weren't uh, specifically searching out, let's say, their social media page to find out this information. It came across in a way that you weren't intending to find it, but it showed up there for you. So if you were to decide to talk with them about it, talking about with them in an individual space as opposed to a group space, much more respectful. Anybody on here do anything different or similar? Going once, going twice. I'm with you, Richard. I would probably just tell them the truth. Look, I came over this um, information um, and I just want to know, you know, from you what, what's the different, what, why, you know, what are the differences in what you let us know versus this? You want to yeah, talk yeah. about it yeah, on a yeah. deal. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Thanks for that, Shelby. What happens mm -hmm. though, if a patient says it, if they say, well, you're saying you have this, however, I know because I listen to the news, or I read this thing, this will happen. And what do you, and what do you do about that when they bring it up? Dr. Bro, are you saying like in a group scenario, like Jay is telling us he's got 60 days sober, but then Shelby says, but Jay, I, I saw your yes. DUI arrest record the other day. You you don't have 60 days sober. Yes. Great question. What would you guys do? How would you handle that? If that was your group therapy setting or, or medication management setting, what would you do? I'm um, asking the individual, are you willing to address that or do you want to just let it go at this point? Great suggestion. Anybody else do anything different? I would say in a, if it gets brought up in a group setting, then I would definitely address it. I would also maybe talk about that confidentiality amongst the group members and what is going to make them feel comfortable and safe. Yeah. If they're like, wow, people in the group could narc on me, then I'm not going to talk about anything. But if right. it comes up, then yeah, you definitely want to acknowledge it. You want to handle it, process it with everybody. Yeah. Yeah, Derek, great point. If that's coming up in a group environment, if we don't address it, then that accidentally sort of communicates to the group, um, you know, that we're not going to be able to help them keep this a safe space. And part of being a safe space is that we're going to help them sort of learn how to deal through conflict. And that's a great point. If a patient says, well, I saw your DUI arrest record on the on a public website, Versus, hey, you told the, the AA meeting that we were in the other day about sobriety. Um, yeah, I think those are, again, two different um, avenues that we're getting that information from, but still talk about that in a group and talk about confidentiality. What, what if, if a, oh yeah, here's please. A, here's another spin. What if a patient from group pulls you aside privately and says, oh, I saw this on there, you know, I saw this on the public website and I think you need to talk to this person about this. Then what do you do? Or a, so she, or, or a family member. Yeah. So if Shelby says to us, hey, Jay, you're going to be my patient all day. So if Shelby says to us, hey, I'm I'm concerned about Jay. I saw this in the news and it doesn't sound like Jay told Joel in group, but here's a worry that I have. 
yeah, any thoughts for anybody in the group how you'd handle that? I think there's a difference between hearsay and actual vision or actual having heard yourself. Yeah. Hearsay has to be treated differently than that. Yeah. Sometimes if somebody asks a question like that or you say, I saw your name in the paper, was that you? Yeah. I'd still do that in an individual session, but I'm just talking about when people are talking about hearsay, unlike an abuse where you have to report something as hearsay, I think in therapy you have to consider it and flag it, but not necessarily incorporate it or use it until the time's right. Yeah, Rich, so, uh, such great points. That's what I've appreciated about everybody's answer so far is nobody has made a, a, a gut check decision here. Nobody's made an absolute decision for this patient, but really the answer has been, we've got to talk to everybody involved. Let's talk to the patient. Let's talk to the person in group who said this. Let's have a conversation, a dialogue about it before we make an ultimate decision. So if Shelby came to me and was worried about Jay, I would probably say, I'd probably ask Shelby, you know, Shelby, I really appreciate your concern. I'm hearing you're coming to me from a place of concern. How do you feel about me sharing these concerns with Jay? So I don't wanna make sure I have her permission to have that dialogue with him. I love that um, sort of added. That's my favorite thing about ethics is, you know, changing one detail, does it change things? So for example, if we change that, so let's say that first case that a patient reports in a group, they have 60 days sober, but their arrest record was printed in the, or was listed in the news over a weekend and they were actually arrested for selling Suboxone. Would that change your decision? Would it change how you handled it with the person individually, how you handled it in the group, et cetera? The second case, I'm sorry, I'm going to move the chat box, otherwise I can't see it. Um, the second case is a patient reports in group that they have 60 days sober, but your gut tells you they aren't being truthful. You know they have a social media profile that they post on regularly, and that I should have said that's public. What would you do? Get a urine drug screen. Yeah, great. So right, right. We don't want to seek that. We're not going to seek out that information because that's not our right to do so. But what are the other mechanisms that we already use in our treatment with them to help maybe answer some some unanswered questions? Yeah, so maybe it's an additional screen. Anybody else do anything differently or similarly? I think that was a little that one was a little bit more straightforward. Okay, great suggestion so far. Um, next one. So this is sort of a part. That's my Halloween. Oh no, let me go backwards. There's my Halloween picture for y'all. So this is sort of part confidentiality, uh, part boundary discussion, but let's talk about the dynamics of our relationships as providers um, with the patient's family. And we're gonna get to the, when we get to the case examples discussion, you're gonna see why I'm really talking more about boundaries here, uh, the boundaries aspect and sort of less of the confidential aspect. So uh, I really like this definition of boundaries that comes from the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. They say professional boundaries are the spaces between the professional's power and the client's vulnerability. So when we talk about boundaries in the mental health field, we're talking about guidelines and rules that help us create that therapeutic frame. And so these boundaries are what help us distinguish our relationships with our clients from the other relationships they have in their life. And so boundaries make the relationship professional, uh, hopefully also safe for the client and the provider, and they really set the parameters for how we're going to be delivering services. An example of a respectful boundary is allowing the patient to make the decision whether or not to involve their family in their treatment. But what happens when a family member wants to become involved um, out of concern for the safety of their loved one? And then they're sharing information with you that could alter how you facilitate that treatment. Then what do we do there? So I've got two case examples here. Uh, the first one is a patient spouse contacts you as the medical provider and asks to speak with you about their concern that, oh, that's a misspelling, sorry. They're concerned that their spouse is back in active addiction but not telling their treatment team. The spouse then asks you to keep this conversation confidential. So question is, what would you do here? Is there a release on file? Oh, 
great question. I'm going to say, um, yeah, I'll say there is a release on file. Um, that the the spouse has the our patient has that spouse allowed to receive kind of general treatment updates from them. But again, the spouse that called asked us to keep that information confidential or that conversation confidential. Could be wrong, but I think even if there is a release of information, you can't keep that confidential, can you? Mm -mm. Yep. So that's the question, right? Do we um, do we owe confidentiality to the wife if she or I said wife if to the spouse if that spouse is in our patient? Yeah, I see head shakes now. Now, professionally speaking, I don't think we would we would owe confidentiality to the spouse because we're not treating that individual. Mm -hmm. Correct. You have to make sure you're all got go with all your HIPAA guidance in your chapter 27.3 and chapter 27.4 to make sure mm -hmm. you don't go beyond the scope of what you can mm -hmm. discuss. Mm -hmm. I think it's always fair to listen or you may have to listen out of politeness, but you don't have to basically re react or respond. Yep. Yep. Very well said. Sarah said it well in the chat. Nope. The client is the client. The spouse is the spouse. Here is a thing I've learned the hard way, both as a therapist and also an administrator here, um, is that people will tell me information and afterwards say, I need you to keep this confidential, but they're telling me information that has now put me in a bind of keeping it confidential. So I have learned the hard way when I'm getting ready to call back a family member who's left me a message. At the start of that conversation, I will say, I need to let you know that I might not be able to keep this conversation private based on what you tell me. Same thing when I have a staff come tell me something in confidence, I let them know ahead of time, I may or may not be able to keep this confidential based on if it's related to patient safety. So I've learned that the hard way that we wanna share that at the top of that conversation. Now, does this change things for you? Um, would it change things for you if the spouse told you that your patient was back in active addiction with either alcohol or benzodiazepines? You know, that patient is in your MAT program, they're prescribed buprenorphine, and now you've been told that they are in active addiction with a central nervous system depressant, would that change things? Or would it change things with you if you are aware that the patient that you see is also abusive to their spouse? Would you that had change a few things? too many variables there, Katie. If, yeah, it's abusive to the, if you're abusive to the spouse, you're mandated reporter. If you're, it's not that and you're talking about the rest of the describing, what you're describing that particular thing, I think you have to consider the uh, who it's coming from, what's being said, and the veracity of what's being said. Oh, great point, Rich. Anybody else? To, oh, Shelby in the chat box said, get a screen. Yes. So that's a way to sort of Jennifer suggested that earlier for a previous case is, can we go back to the way that we identify what's going on with our patient clinically? So can we get a screen? The other thing you have to consider is under chapter 27 of the West Virginia Code, if that individual is um, harmed to themselves or others, you know, imminent harm, that might become one of those things you have to act on also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great point. Now, that's um, a, a tricky situation. So I was always under the impression that if it's a minor or an elderly person, someone who you would think of as a protected person, you were, we were mandated reporters. But in terms of people who live in situations where there is domestic violence, are we mandatory reporters? Yeah, great question, Dr. Bo, right? So what's imminent danger is really where that becomes gray, right? That can become a gray area. And what happens when it's adults in relationships with adults? Somebody else was going to say something when Dr. Bo? Yeah, this is Jen. I was going to say, you know, one question that this raises is, um, do you have to keep the spouse's conversation confidential? But another question that it raises is, at what point do you, is it right to share the spouse's conversation? Because it might just be information. I mean, you know, assuming that we would all listen, obviously, and not share information about the patient, it might not be 
it might not be necessary to share that um, the spouse came to you. Yeah, yeah. Back again, we're back to the issues of Tarzoff and the potential thing, if there's eminent harm to someone else, and it's mm -hmm. potentially there, you'd have to report. And after the Paterno case, you have other situations where reporting that you wouldn't have normally done, now people are expecting to be reported. But under these circumstances, mostly just people talking, not threatening. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, and I wasn't saying that with respect to abuse. I was just saying that with respect to that statement that's on sure. the screen of active addiction. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and if the, if they're using a uh, central nervous system depressant, uh, that that could be uh, an imminent danger to that patient themselves if, if they're on medication for opioid use disorder. Right. Um, yeah. Ethics get so tricky. I think we, but I think we have a lot of ways to follow up with the patient that mm -hmm. are because the spouse could be lying. I mean, without necessarily disclosing where it came from depending right. on the circumstances that right um, i don't think I, I don't know about the necessity of saying where the information came or saying yeah. that there was any information even right given. so we're exactly several of you have recognized that you're getting this information from other avenues what do we do that and it's about going back to the the patient and the patient's care and how can we either gather more information from them clinically, verbally, et cetera. Here's the specific case that was brought to my attention. So the case example two here is that a patient spouse contacts you and multiple members of your agency repeatedly claiming that their spouse is selling their MOUD. The, commu the communication is now becoming what feels harassing to you. What would you do? I would tr I would try to cut that off if it feels harassing and 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 again we have mechanisms in place to try to follow up we have some mechanisms in place to try to follow up on the question of diversion but I would just um, somehow make it clear to the person that they yeah I, mean, I, I don't know what words I would use but I would try to say we we need you to not keep calling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was my thought. And, and with the patient, uh, you know, you could call them in for a random count or or something like that to to follow up with them to to mm -hmm. find out if that is true or or untrue. Yeah. Yeah, I think this site what they essentially what they um eventually did was let the patient know about how their spouse had been contacting, contacting multiple times. The spouse was not surprised because this had been a pattern with them. And I think they ultimately were getting their legal department, department involved to figure out sort of specific languaging to share with that spouse. All great feedback, gang. All great questions. Uh, okay, so this one's a bit of a broader discussion and not necessarily a specific ethical dilemma, but let's talk about now um, the amazing feat that is making mutual decisions as a multidisciplinary treatment team. So for most of us on the call, our MDT is made up of a collection of folks. We've got medical providers like physicians or psychiatrists, nurse practitioners on here. We've got clinical therapists, counselors, social workers, case managers, and peer recovery support specialists. When we think about the characteristics that make up an MDT who work well together, what we see is that they, they get along, they respect each other and each other's roles, they care about the ultimate mission of that treatment team and the agency that they're working with. They can contribute quality time and attention, so they're showing up for the meetings, they're showing up for the services, and hopefully they represent the different aspects of the larger work team. And so collectively as a team, they need to consider the following, that every person on that team has their own ethics codes to follow. And a lot of times those ethical codes will drive with each other, but sometimes they won't. They're all going to have to think about their agency policies. They'll also have to think about the treatment model they're working with, or if they're working in a specific clinic like COAT. 
And then we also have to think about when we make a decision for one patient, that decision is going to be seen and heard by other patients, particularly in our group situations, right? So if I'm doing, uh, if I am bending the rules for Jay and not bending them for Shelby, how is that going to go down in group? By the way, here's our um, treatment team on the farm. As you can see, it's a collection of very different beings, but they're all focused on one key goal, which is to give them more extra food at mealtimes. So here's our case example. At the end of a group session, a patient pulls their case, um, their case therapist, that's not right, their clinical therapist aside, and they disclosed a relapse. They stated that they didn't disclose this relapse at the start of the group because they were experiencing shame. They didn't want to let their group down. Your clinic has a policy that if relapses aren't reported, the patient is to be moved to the next higher level of care. What would you do? Whether it's good or not, I might suggest to the person, are you willing to share that at the next meeting? If not, we may have to move you to the next higher level of care. Yeah, I love that. You're actually involving them in the rest of their treatment, the rest of their group. But let's bring, how do you feel about bringing this back to the group? I love that. Anybody else do anything different or same? I mean, technically they did disclose it. They did report that they relapsed. So it doesn't say when they have to report it, but they did report it. That's true. So let's say you have an agency that says that they're technically supposed to report it at the start of group when they're first checking in. So they're supposed to report it with all the staff they see, and they only reported it with you. Does that change things? I guess the bigger question would be, why didn't they feel comfortable to report it to the main group versus report it individually? Yeah. Yes, well, with sir. Oh, yeah, with, shame and, with shame and guilt, though, you're talking about some of the things that go along with this particular types of issue. And so I think giving some latitude is there yeah. as opposed to just doing it absolute because uh, being draconian about it, you're going to lose this person. Yeah. Whereas you may be able to do it. If they refuse to do it the next time, then you give them the opportunity to change and report in an appropriate fashion. Yep. Right. So to me, that's an example. When we look at ethical codes, there's all these principles. And in a picture perfect world, they're all lining up at the same time. And gosh, does that rarely happen? So we have to think about our loyalty to the patient. Uh, and our loyalty to the group. We have to think about what's best practice for that patient, what's best practice for the group, how do we um, adhere to the integrity of the program, but also meet the patient where they're at. So this was an example where what the treatment team did was a little similar to what uh, you're talking about, Rich, and sort of similar to what you're highlighting, Sarah, is that the patient was honest with us the day of. Would it have been great if they were honest at the beginning? Sure. Was there a therapeutic reason that they weren't able to do that? Yeah. So in fact, what they did was um, explain to the patient, here's our options. What we can do is how, we, how do you feel about us bringing this to the group the next time and letting the group decide on what happens? Because technically with the clinic rules, they could have been transitioned back, but this probably won't be a surprise to you all. The group unanimously said, no, we want this patient to stay in this group. They were honest. They're talking about, you know, they're talking with us now what's going on. And that's what really stood out to them. So they celebrated that patient for being honest. And the hope is that that's going to sort of be filed away in that patient's brain for the next time they have a moment where they're wondering if they can be vulnerable or not. The last time they were vulnerable, they were honored for it. I wanted to add there too, I think if we look at automatically moving them to the next higher level of care, that's going to cause even more shame and guilt. Right. Showing up yeah, at the new people group. might be oh yeah, go ahead, Derek. I was gonna say that that would maybe make people less likely to voluntarily report things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you could advocate for policy change. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing that will happen, exactly what you're talking about, is it'll go into the next groups because other people hear about that and they're going to sit there and basically it's going to reduce the ability for them to communicate those mm -hmm. kind of things as opposed to increase it. Yeah. The other thing about communities is it's not just the group. It's when they go out and they're all living in the same apartment complex. You make one, you change one thing for one person, you're going to better be prepared to deal with the rest of the people yes. living in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, we have all learned our patients talk, right? And so when we're making a decision and sticking with it, we're bending a rule. Can we fake, you know, how are we going to feel about this when our next group says, but wait a minute, you did that for so-and-so and you didn't do it for me. Um, any, think, oh yeah, please. Sorry. Go ahead, Shelby. I, I think it'd be good to have a group on shame and guilt, you know, and how that ties into recovery and that could help you know, have a discussion and kind of start it to kind of normalize it so that maybe it might feel safer for the person to talk about their relapse. Absolutely, right? How can we use this hiccup that happened actually as a wonderful mm -hmm. vulnerability opportunity for everybody in the group? Yeah, well said. We, um, we, we don't necessarily refer to a higher level of care for relapse, but we reset days. And um, I've recently had some people who had a, re so I cover our 90 day group, our weekly group. And I recently had a couple of people who at about day 60 had a relapse, came right in and, and did disclose um, and and had clearly had a ton of shame and guilt right then. They but they disclosed, and I chose in that moment not to not to reset their days because they had because of their honesty. And I said that in front of the group, um, and I told them that I wouldn't do that every time, but that mm -hmm. I just felt like it was a um, unusual occurrence. They had insight into what happened. They were straightforward about it, and I. Didn't want. It was really fascinating to watch the the immediate change in their whole demeanor. I mean, it's so mm. it's just that shame and guilt is so mm -hmm. powerful. Mm -hmm. How did the group respond to that? I think the group was relieved on their behalf as well. And it's a group where you know there are a lot of people who who relapse every week, and every week I reset their days, and they've been in the group for four years, and um, they refuse a higher level of care, and they you know, and we keep trying different things. But they were everybody just thought it was the right um, mm -hmm. uh, the right action. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for or that. at least they acted that way in group. <laughs> what they said at home or on the bus, I don't know. <laughs> I hear that. Nobody's saying they would set up an individual session to discuss the relapse and why they don't feel comfortable in group um, outside of shame and guilt. And if there's people in there they don't trust, and how do you gain your own self trust to disclose in the group? Yeah. It's where I would go. Great suggestion. Absolutely. As opposed to bringing it only directly back to the group, specifically this, the space they had a hard time talking about that with them. How about an individual session to process that more? Absolutely. Great I think suggestion. you also have to sometimes we use the word shame and guilt and don't explain it to the individuals we're talking to. Guilt is for what you've done. Shame is how you feel about what you did. Yeah. Great. Katie, do you have any, if someone were to deny a relapse when we have concerns from it, or again, someone else kind of uh, says that they've relapsed when there's no proof of it? Somebody says like a patient? Like, like say somebody, says, we've when we have reports, again, the family member calls and says, oh. this and, um, I, I find it interesting when people say miss a drug screen and we reset their days or there's some questionable result that doesn't really um, and true. Because I, I talk about it with uh, like court cases, you know, a, mm -hmm. a false negative is is kind of bad to a degree, but if you get away with something, you'll be found out eventually. But a false mm -hmm. positive is potentially devastating for someone. Mm -hmm. And you know, just human nature is if you're actually trying and you're doing the right thing and then somebody accuses you when you haven't mm -hmm. struggled or you get your days reset because your alarm clock didn't go off or something. Mm -hmm. I see that as a lot more devastating than, oh, someone might have got away with something one time on you. So yeah. uh, it just, it, I mean, especially in a court from a court side is, mm -hmm. you know, someone could lose their kids or go to jail forever based mm -hmm. on one mm -hmm. kind of dubious result. So kind of an interesting mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, frankly, that's probably a whole, that's a great discussion for a whole separate echo is how do we, 
how should we evolve current policy to meet the need of, you know, kind of expectations, but also meet the need of our patients? How do we get those two to jive together? Which again, I think is one of the fascinating things I find. I mean, if I think about how many multidisciplinary treatment teams, just we have here at WV Medicine, sort of amazing how well we work together, given that there's so many different codes and agencies that don't align with each other at the moment. Well, uh, Dr. Houston, you sort of brought up an example of the second question. Uh, for other folks, have there been examples of difficult treatment team decisions you've been faced with? And how did you, as a team, come to the agreement that you did? It's been all like science. I think one of the things that people need to basically work with is in a group like that, if you're working for the consumer, you're not working for your ego, you're not working for your turf, you're not working for your own greed. Life goes a whole lot smoother and everybody's able to work together. But if you got to get, this is the psychological part, nothing else matters. This is the medical part, nothing else matters. This is the social part, nothing else matters. Then you basically destroyed the um, continuity and the fiber, the, the fabric of what can make a good uh, you know, treatment team. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think treatment team decisions have evolved mm -hmm. um, over the course of the past couple of decades that I've been a, a provider um, because it used to be that, you know, with pretty much most programs, it was very hardcore. You know, like you're going to, if you make one mistake, you're getting kicked out, cut off, and we never want to see you again, mm -hmm. you know, but now um, it's, it's much more um, humanistic and more, I want to say forgiving, like it's not so hardcore. Mm -hmm. And I think people are, you know, more successful with treatment. Um, probably than they used to be, um, hopefully, um, because, um, you know, there is that humanistic part. It's not just, uh, you know, I guess I'm not really trying, yeah. I don't really know if I'm picking the right words, but it seems like that we're more forgiving, like we're more nurturing than we used to be very, mm, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. First of all, Shelby, I think ooh is a is a word that uh, will actually go down on the notes for today. I think that's a great word to describe that. I also totally agree with you. I think there's a I think there's more person centered that's happening today, yeah. um, which I think is amazing for you know for some of the agencies on here. The fact that we're trying to, you know, for some of us we have hundreds of patients, and so how do we provide individualized pay care for them, but then also follow within the model of the clinic? That's really difficult to do for that many patients. And you're right. I mean, it looks very different. Treatment for us looks different today than it did five years ago, ten years ago, and my hope is five years from now it'll look different. Yeah, I to give you an example, um, many moons ago when I was working at a dual disorder addiction treatment center, all of our folks were court ordered. And one of the rules of the community was if you don't say something and you know something and you don't notify staff, you are equally as guilty. Mm -hmm. So we actually had a one of the people um, in the community went to an outside doctor's appointment and they had made arrangements to have something that they shouldn't have taped underneath the chair of the waiting room of the doctor's office. And so they brought that to back to the community. And we at the time had like 75 people that were all court ordered mm -hmm. that if they did not successfully complete treatment, they would go back to jail. So one person told 74 people didn't. And there were four buses from the uh, county jail roll up and everybody went to jail except for the one person. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. And I was, yeah. Wow. So that was, yeah. that was a difficult treatment team decision. Oh yeah, Shelby. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that would have happened now. No. Yeah. No. I think Sarah had a good yeah. word for it that you were looking for, and that's compassion mm, and showing compassion yeah. towards individuals. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I I think we take a more um more holistic approach to it today yeah. Yeah. than than previously. You know, in my experience, anyway, than yeah. than we ever have. You know, we we look at the person as a whole mm -hmm. and, and not just this one piece of that or that one mistake or that one, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we look at it in, in a more holistic light. Mm, well said, PJ. Thanks for that. I think people are also starting to recognize, but by the grace of God, it could be us. Yeah. Oh, Matter of fact, it is us. <laughs> yeah. All great feedback. Jay, I am aware I was supposed to leave five minutes in the other and I forgot. We're all good. I, nope. We're good. I, Keep everybody, going. everybody had such great things to say. Um, uh, listen, I've shared this model in uh, many of these ethical echo presentations before, so I will not go over it in detail. Uh, but I will just say that when we're faced with an ethical dilemma, we need the guidance of a decision making model. It helps. Um, the model is a culmination of the steps from various models out there. Um, I just saw Ashton's comment, so well said. That's why all members of the treatment team are so integral because it works out with checks and balances. I totally couldn't agree more. So the dilemma we wanna you know, seek out what's the, um, we wanna seek consultation, we wanna define specifically what's happening, we wanna identify the ethical standards, we wanna identify what agency policies, what legal issues that we're dealing with, always wanna identify any cultural issues that we need to honor. We want to revise the ethical dilemma as we're learning more about it. We want to um, identify possible options, develop an appropriate ethical response, and then always, always document. For my final message, here's our Buffalo plan for the day. So just as a reminder, uh, we are going to make mistakes because we're human. We want to help everybody that we can, but we have to accept that that can't always be possible. As providers, we cannot know everything. We cannot expect ourselves to, which is why we continue this learning journey every day for all of you showing up today and participating in the conversation. I truly appreciate that. And then as providers, we cannot and should not do this tough work alone. We need and deserve the support of our colleagues and our peers in the field. And that's my slides. Thanks so much for your discussion, your contributions, thoughts on ethical dilemmas. I really appreciate it. Jay, did you put Buffalo yes, Plan in your I <laughs> totally screwed up. I meant to have it on the whole time. I, you know, they told me to, they prepped me to wear the plaid. I didn't wear plaid. I have a plaid well, I shirt. I didn't have it either. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's the best I could do. Um, I apologize. I'm out of practice. Um, we will but, tell Elizabeth and Mitra that you got it. I mean, I'm recording it. Let, in the let the record time. show. Let yeah. the record show. Do. Well, if you're um, just impressed with Hollywood Square, so you want to put some more behind you. <laughs> yeah, I, that, that's right. Exactly. I'm always, always center square. If there's anything you need to know me, always center square. Um, no, uh, Katie, thank you so much. Um, I did have just a naive question from somebody who's not a provider, not on a treatment team or anything like that, but it goes back with the boundaries and the spouses just thinking, cause my, my wife is in, is a nurse is in healthcare. So just thinking about this is like, it would never be I think it would be, it's hard to know that you as a boundary and as if you get contacted by a spouse or somebody else or something like that, you would never follow up with them. Would you like call them for more information or something like that? That would do you, be. Do you mean like room. if you were my patient and your wife called me to give information? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So like if somebody called, if somebody, a family member called spouse, whoever, would that person on the treatment team who was contacted, if it was you or somebody else, would it ever be appropriate to follow up with that family member to get more information or anything like that? That so generally, from like a it sounds silly, but from a customer service rep perspective, if somebody's left me a message, I'm gonna call them. And so let's say, um, let's say Shelby's your wife, and Shelby calls and leaves me a message. I'm gonna call back and say, Shelby, I, thanks for your call. I just want to let you know I got it. This is me returning your call. I can neither. I'm gonna give her the whole speech. I can't confirm nor deny. Uh, who you're calling in reference to, um, but you sounded concerned on the phone, I'm happy to take your information. And that's the extent of what we can do today on the call. And I also can't confirm I'm able to keep it confidential, but I'm not a fan of 
not returning patients' call or not returning people's calls or returning emails? Because what if it is a true emergency and we've just not responded? I have a question, Katie. Uh, is there any situation where, you know, you could uh, like tell a patient they could never, ever come back, you know, to your office? Like, say, if they brought in synthetic urine a, a couple of times and you told them, you know, you can't do that. Would you let them come back in after a period of time or would you say? Yeah, great question, Dr. Gorby. It's good to see you. We, th there have been a few occasions that we have, it's, I mean, it's a rarity that we have banned patients from treatment. They're often because they're banned from the entirety of WVU medicine. Now this is for patients who somebody had to, you know, file a restraining order against them, or there was, um, you know, an abuse or an assault that happened to a staff member or another patient. So there's, there are rare occasions where that's happened, um, but not necessarily somebody who, you know, we have allowed patients to come back in who maybe brought urine with them. Usually we extend their time out from the program longer, but we as a team will talk about bringing them back. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Bruce, I would say if there's anything with staff harm stuff, again, that would be the point of no return. So if someone's being threatened or physically harmed or something, then they've lost their ability to be at your clinic. Up to that point, it's a judgment call. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? All right, if there aren't any, we will uh, thank Katie again and then also uh, move on. And uh, what I'm going to do for the last just a couple of minutes and then we can we can uh, adjourn is uh, I want to show you what the new system looks like uh, for Echo. And it's called iEcho. And it is, it is think of it as a one-stop shop website for all things that uh, for Project Echo, especially for our Echoes, we're going to move all of them to to this platform. It does uh, make you create an account. It is a one-time account. So once you have an account, if you if you wanna join other Echoes, do other things, you don't make another account, you just get access to them. So it is a one one-time thing. Um, and it will be where you will join the sessions on Zoom. Zoom is built into the platform. It is where all the content will live. So all the past presentations, Recordings, although the caveat with the recordings is we'll also have our YouTube page still and we'll be sending out the links as well. It's just another place for you to be able to get it. Um, and it will be a place for you can send messages to each other through there eventually. That's not active yet, but if you have like a follow up, let's say uh, you don't have to wait for one of us to send the follow up if you don't want us to. If you reach out to us or reach out directly, you can do it uh, kind of through the messaging system of the of the platform, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like to hopefully ease everybody's mind a little bit. I know change is hard. The other thing I want to ask you guys is we've made instructions, uh, you know, nice PowerPoint with instructions on how to make your account. We've got tip sheets to give to you to add the sessions to your calendars and, and do all that kind of stuff. Would having a part of a session be helpful if we just got everybody signed up on the session. Like if we asked you guys right then and there, go ahead, start signing up and we can walk you through it, ask and answer any questions you might have at that very moment while you're signing up. We want to offer that to you guys um, just because, you know, your this project and the, SU, uh, the hepatitis C project have only been going on since like 2016. So it's not like, you know, we've been doing this for a little while. And so we really just want to be mindful of that. Of course, we'll give you all the uh, supplemental documents like the instructions and tip sheets. But um, if that would be beneficial, we can take the, the November sessions, like 10, 15 minutes in each of those sessions in November and just have a live. Let's get everybody signed up for the Echo. I'm seeing some heads nod. Go Jay, ahead and I, put it. Yeah. I yeah. present at the November 13th one, I think. Yes, you are. Um, yeah. And so I, I can make sure that our presentation doesn't, I'm presenting with another clinician, so I can make sure that we, um, you know, leave okay. at least 10, 15 minutes at the end. 
Yeah, and, and the good thing is that this, that part will also be recorded for those who ha weren't able to join and can't sign up right on the dot. We'll do it again in the, uh, you know, I think the November, the next November one might be over Thanksgiving. That might be, I don't know if we're having that one, but we'll at least do a couple of sessions. So don't freak out if you don't make it to that first one. Uh, we'll offer it multiple times. And of course, you can always reach out to us if you have any issues, any problems when we when we start rolling this out, which we'll start rolling out at the beginning of November here. We're, it's not just to the SUD program, but it's going to be to to everybody. Um, but this is what it looks like when you log in after you make your account. It's pretty basic. It's just it's a website. And when you log on, all the pro all the projects you have access to are going to show up right here in the middle. So this is just an example of, of one that I joined just to show you what it would look like. Um, but all you want to do, if you said, I got to join this session, I got all I've got to do is click on this, this the topic title. It's going to give you a little bit of information on it, just kind of what any documents, anything they want you to have prior, a little synopsis. And then you just view details. And this is where all your information is going to be stored. So it automatically sends you to the next session that's going to be available. And you're going to see the title here. When it's time to join the session, there's going to be a big green join button right here. You're going to click on it. It'll take you to the session. Just And Zoom works just like Zoom is on anything else. It's just joining it from here instead of your Outlook email or something like that. Um, all your content's going to be available here. So it could be the PowerPoint. It could be an evaluation. We'll try to put everybody's name in here who's going to be on the schedule. So, for instance, Katie's up next to present. We'll put Katie in here. Uh, if there's a case presenter, we'll do that as well. But if you scroll up to the very top, which is there's been a lot of sessions in this, is here up at the top, you'll be able to actually select what you want to see. So if you want to see the schedule or if you just want to see the content, and this might take a while to load, but this would be content from the entire project. So this is the catalog. You can see this one's been going on for a really long time. And they just have all kinds of different uh, documents. You can view them. You can download them. It's it's really up to you. But this, this is the main thing you're going to use when you make your account. The account is just going to collect your information, kind of like what we do when we uh, put out the registration form for signing up for Echoes. It's going to be your name. It's going to be your email where you're from, um, stuff like that. It's nothing crazy where they're going to ask you to share certain information and all that stuff. If that ever happens to you, if you ever get prompted to do that, we need to know because we have been uh, very strong advocates about this needs to be very easy to use, very seamless with no tricks in it because that's the only thing uh, we're losing a little bit of control as far as being able to just to send out Outlook calendar invites to you guys. It's all going to be in the system now. And so we really want to know if there's anything you don't like about it, anything that seems weird to you, anything. We want to know. Small, large, does not matter. We are very well known in the developer, <laughs> the, the, with the development team of this system because we had a lot of feedback for them uh, initially. Um, and so please let us know. I'm seeing in the chat that uh, people would uh, like to do the... Uh, um, you know, set up the accounts and everything like that. We'll absolutely do that here coming up. So mark that on your calendars. Derek, I will work on my profile. I have not completed my profile. I see that in there. I apologize. Uh, we're getting, we're all getting used to it. Okay. We're all getting used to it, but I see it's five o'clock. Anybody have any questions initially? I know that was a quick run through Jennifer. Real quick, Jay, is the content like all the echoes in the universe or you can sort by West Virginia Echo? Okay, so the content you, you'll be able to see is only within that project. Okay, so SUD content. If you're in the SUD project, it's only the content from that echo. So from, from West Virginia. West Virginia project echo SUD. Okay. It, yeah. Okay. Yep. Eventually, you will be able to get on that website and search other echo programs. So if you have an interest that we don't cover, you can get on there and say, hey, who's doing autism? And boom, it'll take you to all the programs that are doing autism and you can join them as you see fit. But that's coming down the road. I just saw Jennifer shake her head. She just went, nope. <laughs> yeah, no, I know. It's, it, that's why I'm saying we, we, we are really trying to be methodical about this and really putting you guys first. 
like for us, it's it's fine for us as administrators. It's going to be fine. The main thing is if you guys don't join, we got a problem. So we need to make sure you guys are on there. So please don't be shy with the feedback. When we start rolling this out and you make your accounts, let us know because all your input is very important um, and we want to make it as easy as possible. So we're not going to do this until January as far as launching a session and having a session in January. We're going to take November and December with the holidays. We'll just work on everybody getting their accounts and then we'll notify everybody when that first session is going to be in January. It might not necessarily be that first session in January. So we'll just play it by ear. There's no rush, but we want to make sure everybody's on the platform. Hey, are there going to be reminders? Oh, yeah. We'll have now? Yeah, 30, you'll get reminders. And there is an automated 30-minute reminder from the system itself uh, to join the session. So there'll be a couple of different ones. That's a great question. Can we tell organizations we work with about the web page, the session? So that is that we were going to get. I didn't want to take too much time, but I will answer this because it's a great question. The ish, the reason why we're moving to this system is that they want to have a secure way to have the sessions. What they've noticed, some people have been sharing a lot uh, outside of their organization to maybe organizations that they shouldn't have done. So can we share invites? You cannot anymore. They need to sign up for iECHO to get into the session. So if you had an organization or somebody else that wanted to, to join, you think would be interested, you would need to just let us know and we can get the information out to them. You, If you send them your, um, your let's say you download the calendar invite and you send that to them, it will not work for them. Um, so it's just a new security level that the ECHO Institute has put in. We don't really have a say in that. That's going to be the thing. Um, so unfortunately, no, but we will handle that. If you know people want to join, let us know. We can get the invites out to them. So you're treating this as proprietary information? They are, not us. Uh, the Echo Institute is. It's, I don't it's know not. How to you, but they are us if we're having to use them. Yeah, no, that's true. That's very true. Um, it is something uh, as an Echo partner and model that we have to uh, we have to do. Um, so if we want to keep using uh, their stuff and being an Echo hub, that's just part of the deal, unfortunately. So, but it's four minutes after. I um, see people have hopped off. But thank you, Jay. Yeah, let us know if you have any other questions, and we'll we'll be have more information coming out shortly. Thank you. All right. Take care.